virgin most powerful radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. And it's time for us to get into explaining, defending, sharing the faith with clarity, charity, and confidence. It's great to be with you today. And I want to give my little hat tip to uh, the engineer, Richard, for navigating me through some complex issues in how to make an event on a calendar. And I did it, folks. And I'm very proud of it. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. So, you know, hey, you got to take baby steps, you know, every step of the way. And, uh, I guess this is just one more step for me becoming technically literate. So anyway, welcome aboard. Uh, it's going to be a great program. We're going to have our good pal, uh, Master Apologist, Pat Flynn, come into the dojo. Uh, Pat, Pat is an amazing guy. He has his own platform. It's called uh, the Pat Flynn Show uh, he also has Chronicles of Strength. He's a guy that uh, is kind of a life coach. You know, he teaches people how to become uh, more efficient and doing things, uh, excelling in areas. And we actually did, last time he was on the show, uh, we discussed on how to apply some of these skills to apologetics as well. Well, as you know, Pat is a convert to the Catholic faith, and uh, he was an atheist. And it was really at him you know, plumbing the depths of atheistic thought and literature that he realized that there's just something not quite sound with atheism. In fact, something that was pretty much a dead end. And so he started looking into theism quite skeptically, and uh, he started becoming convinced by the arguments of theism. And so today he's going to come on the show. He's going to share with us um, some of the arguments that persuaded him to uh, embrace the fact that God exists and ultimately, you know, that first step on the road, just like me, you know, correctly programming an event in the calendar, <laughs> you know, it's the first baby step towards him entering into the fullness of faith. I don't know if that's a good analogy, but it works for me. And uh, so he's going to be coming on on the other side of the break. And, uh, you know, before I forget, let's do our shout outs. Hi, everybody watching live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, greetings. Thank you for the emoji explosion. Very much appreciate it. Also, I want to welcome all of you listening on radio, uh, Catholic stations far and wide in the United States and abroad, and also via the Internet. Yes. Wow. I think, uh, Richard, did you just give me an emoji explosion <laughs> on YouTube? Uh, if you did, I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and also those listening, you know, on podcast as well. By the way, you probably podcast. You can listen to the program on podcast. Yes, you can. You just go to our website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org, and uh, just go up to our shows and select Hands On Apologetics or any of the other awesome shows that we have. And uh, bang, you got all the shows right there. And folks, you know, use it not only for yourselves, but share it with friends. Tell people about you know, Virtual Most Powerful, tell people about hands-on apologetics because, uh, you know, the more the merrier. And uh, this is kind of fitness class to uh, get us in shape to go into the world and help people know and love Jesus. Okay, so uh, without further ado, we do that by our critical thinking skills segments that we do early in the program. Today, oh, it was Betty. Thank you, Betty. Appreciate the emoji explosion. I don't think I ever got one from that section of the dojo. Uh, today's finding the fallacy is the red herring fallacy. And uh, and so that's a great fallacy that because uh, if you, the argument smells fishy, it could be a red herring. I don't, I'm in a silly mood today. Also, <laughs> our Meet the Early Church Father segment, we are going to meet Athena Goris or Athenagoras from Athens. So uh, that's going to be great. Uh, uh, early church father, uh, if you're an apologist, you're probably familiar with them. If you're not, then you're going to enjoy the segment because we're going to learn a little bit 
about this early church father. And indeed, uh, let's see. Also, uh, you are part of the program. So if you want to give us a call when Pat comes on the show, give us a call at 888-526-2151. That is 888-526-2151. Love to hear from you. Also, you can send us your emails. And I have some really great emails uh, still piling up in the dojo mailbox, uh, perhaps during the holidays. I think that'd be a good time for us to unpack the letters and and share the wealth. Um, but anyway, you can email us at questions at handsonapologetics.com. Hands on Apologetics is one of my two websites, uh, all one word. Questions at handsonapologetics.com and my other website's garymachuda.com. And uh, love to hear from me. Uh, it's, like I said, great emails, and I love it when people share their situations they're in because we can learn a lot from pooling our experience together, and that could help us guide through. When we're in similar experiences, then we have, you know, a light we can follow. So it's much appreciated indeed. So without further ado, why don't we jump to the finding of the fallacy. And the finding of the fallacy today is the red herring. And it's not a fish, but it's a fallacy. Um, <laughs> red herring is a kind of fallacy in which an irrelevant topic is introduced into an argument to divert attention of listeners or readers uh, away from the original issue. So, in other words, it's a big stinky fish that has nothing to do, really, with the topic at hand. And it's a great way, if a person is losing an argument, to throw out a red herring in hopes of changing the topic. Uh, for example, uh, you know, did Jesus establish the Catholic Church? Well, look at all the sinful popes, you know, and look at all the, the um, you know, uh, clergy abuse and all this other stuff. Well, that's a red herring. And it's a particularly smelly red herring because it's very tempting to jump in and start defending, say, you know, which popes are you talking about? Let's clarify, you know, things like that. No, don't fall for it, folks. That is a an irrelevant topic. You could still have a sinful church, and yet Jesus could have established that church, right? So uh, what you need to do whenever somebody throws out a red herring in an attempt to kind of divert the subject, you need to refocus and, you know, zero back in on the original subject. In a way, it's kind of like an ad hominem. Ad hominem is, I think, a species of a red herring. because Ad hominem is an attack that they make against uh, the person and not the person's message, right? And... Uh, that there's another way of kind of changing the topic because it's just natural for us when we're attacked to want to defend ourselves. And uh, so I think the red herring is kind of like that. You know, it's enticing for us to go after the red herring and forget the original issue, which apparently the person doesn't have an answer to or is trying to avoid. Um, and what you need to read focus, just like with a ad hominem attack, you absorb it. You uh, say, uh, I love Trent Horn's approach because he says, you know, accept it hypothetically, no matter what they say about you. You're you're mean, rotten, vicious person. Say, okay, let's say th theoretically, let's say I, I am a mean, rotten, vicious person. Nevertheless, what about this, right? You fo re you absorb it and then you need redirect. With uh, red herring fallacy, basically you just redirect. You say, okay. Uh, Let's, or you could even hypothetically do the same thing. You can say hypothetically, let's say, yeah, there are bad popes and so on. But nevertheless, did Jesus really establish a church? Did he establish the Catholic Church? Let's focus on that. So avoid red herrings, folks. I know the holidays are coming up, but uh, uh, that is a bad fallacy, and uh, you need to avoid it. All right, so leaving the red herring fallacy, let's move to the Meet the Early Church Father segment. And today's Early Church Father is... Anathagoras, Athenagoras, Anathagoras. I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced. Of course, he's from Athens, and he died sometime after the year AD 180. So he's within the realm of uh, church fathers, which we call the apostolic fathers. Uh, nothing really is known about Athenagoras, except uh, the little bit that we can glean from his own writings and also from uh, Methodius of Olympias and some other Methodiuses as well. Uh, would that be a Methodii? Well, anyway, uh, Athena Gorus was a Christian philosopher at Athens. And if we can trust the manuscript title, his supplication for Christians, he was a contemporary of St. Justin Martyr and Tatian, which we've 
discussed actually a couple of previous programs. In uh, rhetorical ability, he exceeds Justin, writing in a very attractive style in Greek. And whereas Tadian, if you remember our, when we talked about Tadian, how he was a vicious polemicist. Uh, he enjoyed insulting people as he tried to defend the faith. Well, Nathagoras uh, doesn't suffer from that. He's not antagonistic at all. And uh, Jurgens, a faith early father, says that Athenagoras knew better than to antagonize with insult, insults those whom he hoped to influence. And that's good advice for us, right? Sometimes it's really tempting to insult people who hold positions that, quite frankly, are kind of ridiculous. But if you're trying to influence the person, insulting them is not the way to do it. If anything, you could influence them not to accept or listen to what you have to say. So, you know, it's good. I think that's a great observation from Jurgens. Uh, the time of his birth and how long he lived, we don't have a clue. Uh, as for his death and the manner of death, uh, we only know that it took place sometime after 180. And also with Athenagoras or Athenagoras, um, we only have one work from him, and that's known as the Supplication for the Christians, written around 177 A.D., so a pretty early document. It, it was um, it was probably an appeal addressed to the Emperor uh, Marcus Aurelius and to his son, Emperor Co Commodus, um, who was given the imperial title in 176 A.D., the work refutes the accusations made by pagans against Christianity, that pagans are atheists, cannibals, and commit incest. Uh, and also he calmly entreats a just a judgment on the part of the emperor in favor of Christians. So that's our Meet the Early Church Father for today, Athena Gorse. Coming up on the other side of the break, Master Apologist Pat Flynn, and we're going to talk about God. Stay tuned. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well-attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist, and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. Jesus said in Luke 17, When you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. According to St. John of the Cross, God is pleased with the little deeds we do in secret, he takes more pleasure in these than in a multitude of grand works that we may do out of the desire to be seen by others. May God help us to do the things that please Him, and not just to appear great in the eyes of others. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
And welcome back, everybody. Hands on apologetics. And we're going to be talking about God and uh, proofs for the existence of God. And uh, the person who's going to walk us through that is an amazing person because uh, he himself was an atheist who uh, kind of plumbed the depths of atheistic thought and uh, came to the conclusion God does exist. So actually, I'll let him tell his own story. And who is it, you're asking? Well, it's Pat Flynn of the Pat Flynn Show. Uh, his show covers everything from fitness to mental health to business to writing to philosophy, theology. He's a best-selling author, philosopher, fitness coach, musician, entrepreneur, and he expounds on the theory of general, generalism, a theory acceptable to each and every one of us. And by the way, uh, you can get all his great stuff and find out more about Pat Flynn at chroniclesofstrength.com all one word chroniclesofstrength.com check it out folks and pat welcome to hands on apologetics gary always a pleasure to be talking with you thanks again for having me on hey well you know it's always fun to have you in the dojo because uh uh you're just a wealth of information and uh so i'm going to try to squeeze as much information as i can out of you on as many shows as i can get you on uh, you know I'm always happy to talk with you, Gary. It's it's always a delight and a joy to be back in the dojo. So excited to see where this one goes. Yeah. So, you know, before we uh, begin, it's been a little while since you've been on the show. Can you maybe just give us a thumbnail sketch of uh, kind of like your journey of faith? Yeah, would be happy to. So I was baptized Catholic, but I grew up in a pretty nominally Catholic family. We were your traditional priesters. You know, sometimes we would go to church when it was Christmas, very occasionally Easter, or whenever the grandparents were in town, right? If the religious grandparents were in town, then then we tidied up and we went to church. Um, my parents um, fell away from the faith probably around the time I was in middle school, and I don't think they became declared uh, atheists by any means. They just really didn't seem to see the importance in going to going to mass or really having much of anything to do in, in, with religion in our lives. And as we know, through statistics and experience, um, if especially if there isn't a strong religious father figure in the household, this really has a negative impact on the children. Um, so I was one of those statistics. Uh, I fell away from the faith myself. And I remember very specifically when those seeds of doubt were first planted. I was in my sixth grade science class, and we were talking about uh, the, the Big Bang and the origins of the universe – and I just remember uh, just feeling very uh, confused and shaken in that um, – just thinking, well, this isn't what I was told in Sunday school. Like this isn't how – you know, I, about God and Adam and Eve and like what, what is all this? And I, I certainly didn't you know, declare myself an atheist in the sixth grade, but those were the first seeds of doubt. Uh, that that over time uh, would would have would eventually you know manifest, and I would um, really not just renounce religion, but I actually became somewhat hostile toward religion for a while. And my other path was uh, through writing. I've, I always loved writers like people like Mark Twain and H. L. Mencken, um, who who themselves often took jabs at, at religion. Mencken specifically was a was a vicious oh, yeah. old atheist, and he passed me off to Nietzsche. And then all the existentialists and old atheists uh, really influenced my worldview uh, through high school and college. Um, and I really tried to, to make sense. I know we talked about this before, so I'll try and condense it a little bit. I really love philosophy, always was still burdened by the big existential questions, and tried to make sense of the atheistic worldview of metaphysical naturalism. As we explained in another episode, that, that really collapsed. I really found it to be um, inadequate, at other times absurd, in trying to explain why anything exists, how to make sense of consciousness, how to make sense of the moral realm, that I eventually came to reject atheism, not by having good arguments presented to me for God by religious believers, but just trying to work through the consequences of atheism and seeing that they were ultimately unworkable. Then I finally turned back to some of the classic philosophers, started with Plato, kind of worked my way up through Aristotle, Augustine, Boethius. And by the time you get to Aquinas, as, as so many other people have um, done before me, I mean, you're pretty much done for at that point, right? Um, you, you know, so I was, I, was, uh, I was something of a Thomist before I was even a Catholic. And that's kind of the ironic thing is I, I really in, uh, loved his metaphysical project. Uh, I was fully on board with how he, he really uh, looked at the world, his his view of reality made sense to me. And I just kind of ignored all of his stuff about Jesus, which is really hard to do with Aquinas because that's yeah, so much right. of his stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, so at some point I decided I, I needed to investigate Christianity itself. And that's when I, I kind of took off the philosopher hat, at least somewhat, and put on more of the, the historian's hat. 
and uh, read, you know, all the the great books making the case for the historical Jesus. Your work was also influential for me, so I need to thank you and all the great apologists. Um, I just want to reaffirm the value in apologetics. If it wasn't apologists making philosophical and historical arguments, I I don't know if I would be Catholic right now. So there really is value in this stuff. And eventually, uh, yeah, I came to believe that Christ— is who he claimed to be, uh, that there's good historical evidence to support that, you know, as, as well as other reasons, and that he gave us a church. He gave us a church that is hierarchical, visible, unified, sacramental. Um, and so I, just two years ago, I was I was confirmed. I finally, formally came back into the church, and my wife uh, came with me, actually, through a somewhat different path, but she was baptized. She was never even baptized. She was baptized two years ago, confirmed okay. last year, so now we're we're fully in, fully on board, Gary. Uh, there you go. The oil is not even dried, and <laughs> you, you are here on the show. Uh, you know, what question I want to ask you. I, I, now, were you familiar with, like, Aristotle and Plato and the other philosophers uh, before, like, you made that turn where, well, atheism atheism doesn't seem to work, naturalism doesn't seem to work? Uh, uh, was that new to you that you said, well, oh, I haven't looked at Plato yet? Or were you already familiar with it, and they were, like, the theistic philosophers that you knew of that you turned to? I was superficially familiar. So, I mean, in your introductory to philosophy courses, I mean, you get you get Plato and you get Aristotle, but it was never in any significant enough depth that I would uh, that I was uh, interested enough to pursue them seriously. And it wasn't until I became more or less convinced that that atheism just and uh, specifically naturalism, which is kind of the strongest form of atheism, just was unworkable that I said, I need to go back and I need to see what what I've missed and I need to start taking these um these other theistic thinkers or, or, or even platonic, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of some middle ground positions, I suppose you could try and work out as well. So I was open to that. Um, so yeah, I had a superficial familiarity with them, but I, nothing in depth until, until much later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. You know, it's funny intro to philosophy classes, I think are the most deadly of all classes that you could take in college because it, it seems to me like at least the, the professors I've had on college level intro classes that they want to rip apart like your worldview and then build you up as a philosopher. But you can't do that in one semester. So they just basically tear apart your worldview <laughs> and hope that you'll sign up the next semester so they can rebuild you. Yeah, they convince everybody that you're just a brain in a vat and you go home and you have <laughs> nightmares. And you're like, I am never taking a philosophy class again. I, I agree with you. My my first uh, – in fact, my very first intro to philosophy course was, was more of like a comparative religions course. It was very odd. And then at oh. that point, I decided – my so I, I pursued my master's in philosophy, but my undergrad is actually economics. And part of the reason for that is I was so turned off by the, the by the initial experience in the undergrad program that I said I'm 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 done with this, right? I'll just study philosophy on my own from there. So that's how I, you know, maybe I would have had a deeper, more proper introduction to some of these um, classical thinkers if I continued on. But like you just described, I had such a a shoddy experience in those intro classes. I'm like, I'll just yeah. I'll go into the other things that I'm more interested, you know, interested in economics and finance, and and I'll just read my favorite philosophers independently. Yeah, and you know, in God's providence, you have brought all that together with your ministry, you know, Chronicles of Strength, because you got business, you got philosophy, you even got religion in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he knew what he was doing. Go figure, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, well, uh, well, we got a couple of minutes. We could probably start at least r- laying the groundwork. Uh, let's, why don't you take us on the journey about, uh, you know, how... Can somebody construct a good demonstration for the existence of God? Sure, yeah. So I, I want to just affirm that um, that the Catholic Catechism actually has something to say about this, and that um, you know Catholics should. I would say that all Catholics should have at least a mild understanding of apologetics. I mean, not everybody's going to be able to lay out a really technical airtight metaphysical demonstration for any particular skeptic at any time. But the cat, the catechism, specifically paragraph 31, uh, asserts that humans can arrive at a basic knowledge of God through a series of, quote, 
converging and convincing arguments, and these are oftentimes called philosophical proofs. And the catechism kind of breaks it into, into two different categories. And this is the I've, I've actually found this classification really helpful and useful in some of my work. And the first of these, uh, the first philosophical approach is from the world or the order or the contingency or the becoming of things outside of us, but but also including us. Um, so that's that's one path that's often called like the cosmological path. And the second approach is from within, and that's by dwelling upon and reflecting upon uh, our internal experience. Uh, oftentimes you hear arguments from, from the moral law that's written on our hearts. Uh, but there's other internal arguments that are sometimes given, such as the dynamism of our will and how we long for the infinite, right? We keep bumping up against limits in existence, and we want to we know what is beyond those limits, and we're searching for the infinite and for this ultimate source of happiness that can only be found in, in that sort of unrestricted act of existence itself, which is God. So the catechism doesn't it, – it, it's interesting because it doesn't specifically endorse any one particular argument. It's, it's, it doesn't say go with the second way of Aquinas, but it gives a general uh, idea of how you can approach this, and it affirms that it can be done. Um, which I think is is really um, inspiring and should encourage many Catholics to go out and, and, and pursue this. And I'll just quote the catechism one more time. It says, the, the world and man attest that they contain within themselves neither their first principle nor their final end, but rather that they participate in B, capital B, being itself, which alone is without origin or end. So that's just, I guess, an initial note of um, how we can – proceed here. And uh, depending on how much time we have, maybe we can we can get through two different arguments. But I was planning on um, looking at the, fir the first approach, the cosmological approach, and then maybe uh, looking at the, the sort of internal approach from the from the moral realm. So any questions or comments so far, Gary? Uh, no, uh, you know, it's funny. Many people just think there's only five arguments for the existence of God, you know, Aquinas is five ways. But like you pointed out, the catechism shows there's lots of different you know, a uh, variety of uh, ways you can get to it. But, uh, well, okay, uh, boy, we, we have about a minute and a half. Uh, I hate for you to start, and then the music comes <laughs> up. Well, maybe I can just say one, one thing before we go into the specifics of the argument. And I've often found that sometimes people are really inspired just by hearing a list of possible arguments, even without yeah. getting into the details. Sometimes you can just say, hey, look, I think that God exists because God is the best explanation for why anything exists over nothing, for why the universe began to exist, for our perception of objective moral values and duties, for the intelligibility and the order and stability of the cosmos, for the uncanny applicability of mathematics to reality, uh, to mystical experiences, to religious experiences, to near-death experiences. And maybe we could add like 12 or so more, but just hearing this list. And we're not saying – and we're being somewhat modest. We're not saying God is the only explanation, but he's the best one, and he's the most unifying. So maybe you think that other things might be as good of explanation for any one of those things, but taken as a whole, God is by far the best explanation and the simplest, most unifying explanation of the, you know, the incredible diversity of experience that, that we have in this world. It's, uh, and sometimes that enough is just alone. Uh, sometimes be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then you're done. You're like, I haven't even given the arguments yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're chatting with Pat Flynn. And we're going to be talking about how to prove God's existence. More to come on the other side of the break, folks. You're listening to Hands On Apologetics. Stay tuned. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he's a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app <laughs> for him. I went on vacation, and you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He was kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle and he says to me, hey, man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the mass in the morning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's an uh, on-fire Catholic and he promotes uh, the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Wow. Daniel, what a testimony. And I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith. 
by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee... They will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Master Apologist Pat Flynn, and uh, we're going to talk about the existence of God. And that was a really cool list, by the way, that you rattled off perfectly on time last segment. So where do we begin? You know, how do you begin the contingency argument? Yeah, well, it begins with a simple question. How come anything? Or or why is there something and not nothing instead is is how this question is famously provoked. So what I've done is I've I've come up with a specific outline of of this argument that – and I I will have to invite the gentle listener to be a a little bit patient. It can be a little bit technical, but I'm going to do my my best to make it accessible as possible. And then, Gary, please interject at any point if we need uh, any clarification. But to kind of give an idea of what we're working towards because sometimes – you know. We're not going to assume the thing we're attempting to prove, but it sometimes helps to just start with a, with a, with a picture in mind of, of where we're going. Um, this, this type of argument is, is really helping to establish that, one, reality is self-sufficient, that nothing could have caused reality, which is a really interesting thing to think about, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute. And the only way this can be possible is if there is a qualitatively perfect unrestricted act of being at its foundation, and this we would we would all refer to as God, and that anything else that exists in a sort of limited or finite way is really something that, that is, uh, is a subtraction from the fullness of God's existence. It's a limitation. It's a, it's a, it's a restriction. So kind of a way to think about where we're going with this is if, if you imagine how that God is like thinking up the world, and as he's creating things, he might he might say of them or think of them this exists and it's like me, but only to this extent or only to this degree or only to this perfection. And it's it's bounded in its existence, meaning it exists again, but there's a limit to how it exists or in what it can do. And so it, it requires some explanation beyond itself. And if we if we push this principle of explanation through that anything with with a limited essence needs an outside explanation, we, we ultimately arrive at something without limits entirely. So that's kind of the, the general overview of, of where we're going. And sometimes it's helpful just to get that sketch out there before we dive any deeper. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I, I love it when people kind of tell you, OK, here's the goal and here's how, how we're going to get to that goal before, you know, getting into the the actual argument, because you could really easily get lost if you didn't know where you were going. Yeah, I agree. So now, now we have to now we have to work it out. Now we have to prove it. But with that in mind, I think it helps give some some clarity, and it also echoes what the Catechism says, where everything else that exists apart from God participates in this perfect and infinite source of being. And this is not only a deeply biblical insight, but we can get there philosophically as well. So let's uh, let's begin, and then if we need to break it up or pause as we go, uh, we can do so. So I, I've, I've divided this argument into three stages, and the first stage is to show – is to move from uh, conditioned realities to unconditioned realities. Now, I'll, I'll define terms as we go, and there's just, just two terms we need to be familiar with uh, to get this first stage of the argument off the ground. And what we're trying to do here, again, just to get the goal in mind, is to show that reality is incredibly and in, in some way self-sufficient. Right? There's some aspect of reality, there's some layer or foundation to reality that exists 
in in virtue of what it is, it has a special nature, an independent nature. Um, so two terms I want people to be familiar with. The first one is is conditioned reality, and a conditioned reality is any any reality, any being that is dependent upon another reality for its existence, and therefore it requires the fulfillment of conditions for its existence. So an example of that would be a cat, or, or pretty much anything you can point to, or smell, or poke, or, or mostly even things you could even think about. Uh, so a cat exists only because, one, its parents procreated, but also because there's the concurrent existence of the cat cells, the Earth's atmosphere, the electromagnetic fields. So it's this confluence of, of conditions being fulfilled that allow for the existence of the cat. And if you were to kick out the stool of prior existential causes or conditions, the cat would suddenly not exist, right? And it's not just prior conditions. It's not just the cat's parents, but it's current conditions as well. So it's both a sort of looking vertically and horizontally, like down through the chain of being, but also back in time. It doesn't have to be either or. It's, it's, it's actually, we would say it's, it's a both and in this regard. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is an unconditioned reality. And this would be any reality that is independent of any other reality for its existence. So it requires the fulfillment of no prior conditions for its existence. Now, we're not saying that an unconditioned reality exists yet. We're just saying that's what an unconditioned reality would be. So how are we doing so far, Gary? Clear enough? Yeah. So if you have a cat, let's uh, say the cat's name is Felix. Like it? <laughs> and, yep. And one of the contingencies of Felix existing is that there is a certain force that keeps the atoms and molecules together. If you kick out that foundation of the atoms and molecules keeping them together, then Felix disappears. Goodbye, Felix. Yep, That's and you right. could take, take cats, you could take electrons, you could take an Arby's Big Montana sandwich. Yep. All these seem to be conditioned realities. Okay, so let's move into okay. the first step of the argument, and that is that conditioned realities exist. Obviously, things like cats exist, right? Things come to be, they pass away, they could exist otherwise. So these we call conditioned realities. Like you said, they could also be called contingent realities or cause causes. And they're existentially, or to use a, a $7 word, ontologically dependent upon other realities. Some of them looking back in time, but, but others concurrently, simultaneously, here and now. So a conditioned reality, whether we're looking at cats, amoebas, or electrons, again, is any reality which depends on a prior set of conditions being fulfilled so that reality can exist. Um, now, here's the kind of critical question we're asking, right, is could all of reality, the totality of reality, whatever that is, could that be collectively a conditioned reality? And the answer here is most emphatically no, it could not be. Because if all of reality were collectively a conditioned reality, then the totality of reality – again, whatever that is, it doesn't matter what the details are, but whatever the collection of all reality is – would itself be awaiting on the fulfillment of conditions outside itself in order to exist. But there's nothing outside reality in total which could fulfill those conditions. If it's, if it's not in reality, then it's literally nothing. Therefore, if all of reality were just a collection of conditioned realities, then all of reality would literally never have come to, to exist. It would, be, it would be zero, nada. To use more uh, casual language, you can just ask, could anything have caused reality in total? And the answer is obviously no, it, it couldn't. Like what could have been outside of reality to cause it? It's, it's absurd. So this leads us to a pretty uh, radical but fundamental conclusion. And that is that there must be some aspect of reality that exists in an unconditioned way that has an, that is an independent foundation or we might call it an existential plug-in port uh, from which all conditioned realities ultimately derive their existence. And to deny the existence of at least one unconditioned reality in, in the totality of reality um, would, would either commit you to, the, to a fundamental contradiction – saying that there exists conditioned realities whose conditions, whose conditions for existence have not been fulfilled, which makes no sense. You might also say a caused reality that exists without a cause. It's just a, it's like a square circle. It makes no sense. Or you would just commit yourself to the absurd position that nothing exists. So we seem like we have a, a really airtight argument here about, about the, the foundation of ultimate reality, which is really significant. Now, we haven't shown that this is God per se yet. But this is not an insignificant conclusion. So why don't I, I pause there and we can uh, maybe unpack some of that or discuss uh, any questions or potential objections. Yeah, you know, I think of the popular mind when people think they're proving the existence of God. It's like you're climbing a ladder up to 
the most developed, you know, the most sophisticated being there is. But actually what we're doing is we're looking for the lowest, most fundamental foundational aspect of reality. That's God. It's more like we, we're looking for the palm of God's hand rather than climbing a stairway to heaven. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a really uh, yeah that's a really good way to to think about it. Is God is just so metaphysically enormous. He's so metaphysically big. He's he's all enveloping. Is really where we're trying to go, right? And everything yeah. is really just kind of falling out of God, or is a subtraction or limit, or a mere reflection, a limited reflection of God. So that's again that's where we're going. But this is a significant uh, step in the argument, and it's actually. Um, one that has seen significant philosophical progress. A lot of philosophers have really come to recognize, yeah, it seems like we need some necessary foundation to make sense of reality as a whole. So for people who say that philosophy never makes any progress, uh, it sometimes does. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes does. Um, yeah, I so, think – doesn't Dawkins like admit that there there has to be a foundational like first cause, but but he sees it as matter, as physical stuff? Whatever that yeah, is. and and that's an important point. Is is some atheists will grant it, it, things that we've just said, and but then they'll just say, well, why can't it be? Why can't it be matter? Why can't it be an electron or something like that? And that's going to have to be the next step of the argument. Now I'll say there's okay. there's sort of an intuitive sense that a lot of people have when you reach this that it doesn't seem like it would be an electron. It doesn't seem like it would be an Arby's roast beef sandwich. Like that seems. <laughs> <laughs> that that just seems fundamentally arbitrary and unintelligible that that would right. be the foundation of reality right but we can push that further but i, I just want to acknowledge that there's a there's a deep intuition in people that just it seems like no it like it doesn't seem like anything that would be limited finite or composed of matter or parts would be that foundational reality so yeah, yeah. um as cool as it would be if it were a, <laughs> an arby's big montana i don't think it's going to work <laughs> Well, yeah, and also, you know, it'd be the Arby's Big Montana's contingent, right? It, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so that's right. It could not be. So, and it comes into existence as well. So, it's dependent on its existence from something else. So, ultimately, that can't be the ultimate end, as as delicious as that may be. Now you're making me hungry. I know. Yeah, it's right around lunchtime too. So we know what yeah. we know what I'm doing after this. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So. uh so that's great. Yeah, we get to the point, and like you said, I think a, a lot of non-believing philosophers would accept that. The next step is like, okay, well, well, how does it end up that you know, the, the cause of all this has to be God? Why can't it be something other than God? Yes. So let's push this forward now, because uh, I want to acknowledge again that first that first conclusion is is significant. It's a powerful conclusion because it gives us uh, some type of necessary reality and that's that's definitely checking one of the boxes uh for god undoubtedly um but let's go further so the the next step okay. is to argue from the finite or finite restricted beings to the infinite so this is this is where we get from the the foundation uh, the unconditioned foundation uh to god and really what the argument is saying is nothing can be an unconditioned foundation unless it is qualitatively perfect and the and an infinite source of being. Uh, so nothing. Another way to put it is nothing can serve as that self-sufficient foundation unless it is unlimited, qualitatively perfect, and the infinite source of being. So that's that's what we're attempting to show. And I think that this is the form that contingency arguments typically take. We have one stage, then we have the second stage. I hear the music, so this is probably a good place to pause. <laughs> yeah, this is a great cliffhanger. All right, we're talking with Pat Flynn about the existence of God. We're going through the contingency argument. Uh, you want to find out how the argument ends on the other side of the break. This is Jesse Romero. And I'm Terry Barber. From the Terry and Jesse Show. And we invite you to listen to the Holy Hour of Power, High Energy Catholic Radio. We're two Catholics with a PhD in common sense. We're on Monday through Friday on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. What we're going to give you is masculine Catholic teachings on the faith. You know, we say we're too inspired to be tired, we're too protected to be dejected, and we're too renewed to be subdued. Why? Because we believe in Jesus Christ and His Bride, the Church. And we will take each issue of the day and show you how the Catholic Church has the answer for our culture. What we really do is bring men back into the Catholic Church, which it's about time to do. We want men to be leaders in their Catholic faith so that they can bring their family to heaven. Our program is not right versus left. It's 
right versus wrong, and our program is where Catholicism and culture intersect. It's High Energy Catholic Radio. We're going to inspire you to fall deeper in love with Jesus Christ and His bride, the Church. The Terry and Jesse Show on the Virgin Most Powerful app. In Luke 7, Jesus said, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven her because she has been shown great love. According to St. John of the Cross, Christians should always remember that the value of their good works is not based on number and excellence. Their value is based on the love for God that prompts them to do the works. May we always be motivated by true love for God and not worry so much about what we do, but why we do it. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. We're chatting with Pat Flynn of ChroniclesOfStrength.com. And we're working through uh, what's called a contingency argument for God. And Pat has done a great job uh, starting up the first step of this argument. And uh, so we, we got to the point where... Uh, you know, you can't have reality. Reality can't be conditioned on something other than itself because there's nothing other than itself. And so now we're looking at, well, what what is it dependent on and why would we call that God? So, Pat, why don't you take it from there? Sure. So so we the first stage of the argument um, argued for some unconditioned reality as the foundation and and the reason for why anything else exists right anything else that exists that is a conditioned reality ultimately ultimately not necessarily proximately but ultimately has to have its conditions fulfilled by this unconditioned reality now what we want to do next is argue from the finite to the infinite and show that um in order to have this type of self-sufficient unconditioned foundation uh, it, it cannot have any limits, restrictions, or uh, or arbitrary boundaries on being. It really has to be the perfect and full plenitude of being itself. Um, so yeah, we'll take this step by step, and then we can you know hash and discuss any of the details along the way. All right. um, so the first so the first thing to recognize is that finite conditioned realities exist. Um, now philosophers have used different terms, so I want to kind of take a broad approach here and and help people come at this a couple different angles. So uh, finite realities. Um, People have often called um, existing essences or something which exists but only in a particular limited way. It, it only exists this, this much or to this degree or intensity or to this capability. And we, we already gave an example of this, a cat, right? But also an amoeba or an electron or the Arby's roast beef sandwich seems to be the theme of the day. Um, mountain range, again, pretty this microphone, all these exist in a limited way. So a cat, you know, it exists in a cat mode of existing. It purrs, it meows, it scratches things, whatever cats do. And it's it's obviously distinct from an electron or an amoeba. And so it's they're similar, these things, in this in in that they all have an act of existence, but they're also diverse in that they don't exist in the same mode or way. They have different limits, different boundaries on, on their actual being. So finite realities are comprised of limits. They are restricted in being. They do not have the full plenitude of existence. Um, now, what we want to argue is that reality cannot be self-sufficient unless there is at least one unlimited, qualitatively perfect, and infinite source of being to serve as that unconditioned reality, which ultimately fulfills the conditions for everything else in existence of, aside, of course, itself. Now, I'm going to give three reasons why uh, I believe this is true, three arguments to support this. So okay. let's do it. Um, so number one, to exist in a particular way, that is to, to have a limiting essence, 
is not to exist in another particular way. So for example, this is this is pretty obvious. It might be technical language, but it's it's just really saying that to exist as a cat, for example, is not also to exist as a dog. Something cannot exist as a cat and not a cat at the same time and the same place. That's just that's just a contradiction. So limits or limiting essences ex- exclude by their by their nature the the possibility of one reality from another. Another kind of simple example would be thinking of a square in a circle. If something exists with the essence of a square, it's not also able to exist with the essence of a circle. These limits and boundaries exclude one reality from another. This is why we say there's no such thing as a square circle. It's a contradiction. Um, so this might help actually give some some deeper metaphysical grounding to the law of non-contradiction by exploring this. Um, however, and this is a key point, the unconditioned reality must be able to fulfill – the conditions for all real and really possible realities. And so it cannot be incompatible with them. It cannot exclude these realities from itself. It must therefore be free of any and all limits or restrictions on being which could exclude any real or really possible reality from it. So this is how we start to show that whatever this unconditioned reality is, it must be unlimited, unrestricted. So for example, if an electron, a limited reality, were the unconditioned reality, then the existence of protons would not be possible since electrons, by their limits, the restricted active existence, exclude protons. You can't be a proton electron. That's like a square right. circle. So limits block explanatory power, and we need something to explain all limits. So something then must be free of any and all essential limits. So that's one argument that we can give, and that's a somewhat technical one, but I find that one to be pretty powerful. And it would essentially rule out any possible material foundation since all material things exist in a limited, restricted sense. But we can continue on, and Gary just interject at any time if we want to dive a little bit deeper. But uh, I'll, I'll continue laying out these, these uh, arguments here. Oh, you're doing a great job, I, but I'm focused on the Arby's roast beef, so I'll be honest. <laughs> I shouldn't have thrown that But no, that, that was an excellent point. So in order for triangles and circles to exist, in a sense, the, whatever the most fun, fundamental thing is, it has to account for both, even though they can't exist together as one. It has to be so absolutely metaphysically simple that it can't exclude any real or possible yes. reality from itself. Because if if something could it couldn't have its uh, fulfill, you know, the conditions for its existence ultimately fulfilled, then it's not even a really possible reality. It's just, that's just a yeah. contradiction. Good. Um, all right. So let's go to the second line of support here. So to exist again in a particular way, to have like a cat-like a- a- essence or an amoeba-like essence, is to be determined to exist in that way by something beyond itself. And therefore to lack the sufficient or adequate explanation for its existence. So limits not only block explanatory power, as we just mentioned, but they also require explanations for why limits in here, why this particular essence, why this you know, particular mode of existence and not some other, why this individuated act of existence, why was it determined to exist this way rather than that? So the very nature of limits, the principle we're getting at here, stands in need of an outside explanation. Now, here's a kind of key uh, – and this is obviously true in, in empirical experience. We come upon something that's limited, and we realize that a, you know, usually a confluence of different causes made it to be that way. But, but what I'm saying is there's, there's, a, there's a metaphysical principle here that all limits stand in need of an outside explanation. Um, but here's another key point, right, is that to have a limit, just, just to have any limit whatever is itself a limit. That's just true by definition. But we can't explain the existence of all limits by invoking further limits. That would just that that would that would be absurd. So we we need to explain all limits, but we can't explain all limits in terms of further limits. So we can only explain the existence of limits by something that is completely without limits whatsoever. Now I know that might be uh, very confusing in uh, in the way that I word it. So I'd like to read a quote from Father uh, Norris Clark, who I think puts it a lot more eloquently than I do to help drive this home, and then we can. Uh, take any questions or uh, hash out any details. So I, I've, I love the way that he puts this, and this is from his book, The One and the Many, which is a great resource for people if they want to dive deeper into this. He says, no finite being can be self-sufficient. Why? Let us suppose if it were finite, uh, that means it would, it, would, it, would, uh, it would be one determinate limited mode of being 
among at least several other possible modes of being, such that at least one higher mode were possible. Otherwise, it wouldn't be finite or limited. Now, there must be some sufficient reason why the being in question exists in this limited, determinate mode of being and not in some other possible. Why this being or this whole finite world system and not some other? A principle of selection is needed to select this mode of being from a wider range of possibility and give actual existence to it according to its limited mode or essence. But no finite being can do this selection of its own essential mode of being and confer existence on itself in this mode. For then it would have the impossible task of pre-existing its own determinate actual existence in this mode, picking out what it wills to be before it actually exists, and then conferring actual existence on itself in this mode. All this is obviously absurd, unintelligible. It follows that no determinate finite being can be the self-sufficient reason for, the, for, the, for its actual existence as a finite being. Therefore, it requires an independent, efficient cause or source of being to determine it to exist as this finite mode of being. But since no finite cause could ever be self-sufficient, we must eventually come to some infinite cause or ultimate source of all uh, of all finite beings. So I know that was quite a mouthful of a paragraph there, but um, I think Father Clark really drives the point that in, if, if we were to suggest that a finite limited mode of existence could be the ultimate explanation, we run into this absurdity that would have to pre-exist itself to determine to exist in a particular way, uh, which is obviously I don't think something that any reasonable person is going to want to yeah. accept. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, uh, well, let's drive the conclusion home. So what does that mean for the unconditioned reality? Yeah, so I think there's a simple thing we can do. And, and the, third, the third thing here is kind of a simple thought experiment when we realize uh, we can think of existence as either a minimum or a maximum. Uh, so sometimes people will say, okay, things exist. So what is the relation of existence and essence? Like maybe like existence is, a, is sort of like a minimum and we add things to existence, such as essences, to get the world of our experience. But then you realize that this is, this is impossible. Uh, you can't add something to existence because apart from existence, there's nothing to add. It doesn't exist. Right. So rather you have to flip it and you have to realize that existence can't be a minimum. It has to be an all-enveloping maximum from which every limited mode of existence falls out is a restriction, a limitation, a subtraction from the plenitude of being itself. So God, the way that, that, that we're, we're kind of uh, – and this I think is the brilliant insight of St. Thomas, this participation metaphysics, is giving us and donating being reflections. He's parceling himself out and off in these, in these mere um, finite limited reflections of himself. And that he is the all-enveloping maximum. He's so metaphysically enormous. Now, the one the last step in this is just to go from the many to the one. And once we've got this self-sufficient foundation that's unlimited, perfect, and infinite source of being, we can quickly deduce that there can only be one of these. There can only be one such being. Because if there were two or more, we need some way to, to tell them apart, to differentiate. And for that to happen, one would have to lack something which the other had. And, but then that something would no longer be the perfect, unlimited source of being. Uh, so, so this self-sufficient foundation is one and only one, perfect, unlimited being in and through which all limiting essences participate. Um, you know, you can call that yeah. God if you want. I think it sounds like God to me, <laughs> but people will, <laughs> can select their own terms, you know, according to their, to their preferences until we make further arguments for a specific religion after that. <laughs> hey, there you go. So, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, that sounds, uh, sounds like God to me as well, you know. And the beautiful thing, it explains why Arby's Roast Beef has, participates in all the beauty and goodness of God. Uh, yeah, and what a beautiful reflection <laughs> that is. <laughs> especially before lunch. Pat, where can people get a hold of your stuff? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, my podcast is The Pat Flynn Show. Every Friday we do a segment called Philosophy Friday where we kind of dive into uh, – we're actually doing a series on natural theology and metaphysics right now, so it would be very congruent with this. Sunday School, I have a lot of cool people on, like Gary Machuda, to dive deeper into the into theology and the history of the Catholic faith. So I think your listeners would probably enjoy that. Also, chroniclesofstrength.com is my website. My email list is there. Uh, those are the primary spots. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Gary. All right. Pat Flynn, check it out, folks. Chroniclesofstrength.com. Great stuff coming from him. And talk about great stuff. Coming up next, high-impact Catholic talk from the dynamic duo of uh, 
Catholicism and Talk Radio. It is the Terry and Jesse Show, so you don't want to miss that. It's time for us to shut down the Midwest Command Center here and turn off the dojo lights. It's been great being with you today, and God willing, we'll see each other tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.